skies will be filled with the greatest air armada the world has ever seen. Our own Army Air Forces, the best planes ever built, 65,000 planes this year. And by the time you finish your training, America will have overwhelming superiority in the air. Am I on yet? Thank you. Can you hear me okay? No? Yes. Good. Okay. Um, everybody get the scan done. If you need, go out to the YouTube channel as soon as you can. This is my uh, briefing this morning. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I just told you. So that's a military <laughs> briefing style. I'm going to talk about the origin, the design of the 80-5 or the A1E model, which is what we have right here. Then I'm going to talk about the variant and mission types of each of the models uh, for the Sky Raider. Then the Korean War actions by the Navy and Marine Corps. And then Vietnam is the next war that comes along. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Navy, initial Navy operations, and then the uh, VNAF, the Vietnamese Air Force, and then the U.S. Air Force participation. Then I'm going to talk about the history of our Sky Raider, and then at the end I have a special feature. Uh, what the Navy wanted to do during World War II was create a single aircraft that had dive bombing and dive and uh, torpedo bombing capabilities. High performance, a lot of ordnance, get to the target, long distance uh, action, and especially in the, the uh, island to island hopping during the Pacific War. Uh, design proposal work started in 43 and into 44. And then and the Navy asked for some prototypes. Uh, this one from Curtis, Kaiser Fleet, Fleet Wing, uh, Glen L. Martin Company, and then Douglas Aircraft Company. And you can see the Douglas uh, prototype is what you see as the Sky Raider for the single cockpit. They did accept that one. They actually looked at two other uh, prototypes that they really didn't push forward at all, uh, the destroyer and the Sky Pirate. But Douglas aircraft would replace the Dauntless, the Avenger, and the Helldiver. And this first flew in March 18th of 1945 when World War II was still going on, born in World War II. Navy did an evaluation after the first flight on May 5th, 1945, they ordered them into production. Uh, initially, the uh, attack designation was added uh, to the Navy designation for aircraft. So you have attack A, D for Douglas, and a dash one. So it was an AD dash one. The Sky Raider is the name. Uh, Dauntless II was something that was proposed by Douglas, and Navy said, no, I want Sky Raider. Uh, nicknames, Able Dog, which is a takeoff from the uh, designation of the aircraft. Uh, flying Dump Truck, it had a lot of stuff to drop on target. Uh, SPAD was a reference to a World War I aircraft. Um, and of course the Fat Face, and it's only re reference to the 80-5 version, which is ours. And it kind of, when you look, pilots looked at it and they thought, well that's a Fat Faced aircraft. So that's why that nickname stuck. Uh, 3,180 were built uh, in production through 1957. And they entered fleet service in November of 1946. Uh, just a short historical note, President Truman declared the end of hostilities for World War II on December 31st, 1946. So this is an aircraft that was a World War II aircraft design. Here we have the design drawings built around a barrel-like fuselage. This is a side and front view from Douglas uh, paperwork. Had a length of 40 and one half inches, a height of about 15 foot, eight and a half inches, and a wingspan of around just a tad over 50 feet. Uh, a 3350 engine, that is the same engine as the B-29s, the Super Fortress. Very powerful engine. Range approximately 900 miles, about 300, uh, 320 miles max speed, cruise speed about 190. This is the weapon systems, and this is really applicable to all the designs for the Sky Raider. But you had 14, excuse me, 15 hard points, 12 on each side, uh, folded wing of the Arrow 14 bomb racks. On the three hard points on the main body, you had a, two Mark 51s and an Arrow 3A centerline. Uh, bomb rack. Now, those bomb racks on the main body could accommodate fuel tanks. 
8,000 pound bomb load, more than a B-17 bomber. And then four 20 millimeter cannons. Okay, about 200 rounds a piece for each cannon. For the design, that back area that you see, and that you see a blue tint on the window, that was referred to as the blue room. And I'll probably make reference to that later on in the, in the presentation, but that was the blue room that, that was, it was called. You can see it's a military passenger aircraft, a COD aircraft, a carrier onboard delivery uh, carrier. But there are other mission sets that you could put in the back. And this is the two seat, a four seat version. There was a two seat version, but this was in the back for other crew, for other mission types. And I'll talk about the mission types in a moment. Also, an ambulance. This is the four litter installation and to get those patients up there, you had a rig system that was off the wing that could load the patients up in the rack there. That could also be used to carry equipment in the back. An additional feature that they put in the back, and I don't think it was used very, very often, was a fuel cell that had about 155 gallons of fuel and a 12 and a half gallon oil, engine oil supply for long range. Uh, this aircraft had about a 380 gallon internal fuel supply. The mission types that we had for all of them, we had the night version, electronic countermeasure, uh, radar, dome or airborne radar, uh, nuclear capability, which didn't last very long. The Navy didn't think it was feasible for a propeller aircraft to try and <laughs> deliver a nuclear weapon. It wouldn't survive for sure. Uh, utility, and that mainly was applicable to the AD-5 version and then the anti-submarine warfare equipment. These are the models that were built. The prototype 25 were built, mainly as a, a testing and evaluation platform for those mission types. The 80-1, 277 were built, another upgrade to the engine. Uh, let me point out, a, a, today there is an 80-1 flying today in the United States. It's painted up as a Vietnam Warbird, but it's an AD-1 model. So that's the oldest Sky Raider there is flying today. Uh, the AD-2, were built, greater strength on the, on the overall internal fuel increase. Uh, another upgrade to the engine. The AD-3 at 194 built, new canopy design and another uh, improved landing gear and engine cooling. The 80-4, 1,051. This is the most of any of the models that were built. And you can see the improvements there. Another upgrade to the engine, a modified tail hook, improved cockpit windscreen, uh, four 20 millimeter cannons versus two on the previous versions. Uh, the pilot system, and then the 80-5, which is ours. Pilots are sitting side by side rather than a single pilot uh, canopy. And of course, an accommodation for other crew members for other mission types. Uh, they were first built in August of 1951 under the 52 contract and some service was later on in 52 and in 53. The Dash 6, 713 built, um, single, back to the single seat, strength and wing structure and capabilities. The Dash 7 at 72 built, another increase in the engine, uh, uh, upgrade in the engine and back to the single canopy uh, design. These are a few examples of, uh, this is the night version examples, and, and you can see the blue room in the back, an extra pod on the earlier versions for the night vision, or excuse me, night attack. Uh, this is an ECM version. There's a slight modification on the back area right here. That restricts the sunlight coming in the back so mission uh, crewmen can see their scopes. I mean, if there's too much sunlight in, in there, it kind of screws up your capability to see anything. Then the airborne radar, it does have the modified canopy in the back in the blue room area, but note there are no guns and there are no bomb racks. That's a high altitude aircraft for airborne radar. The Navy, Marine Corps and the Air Force use them into the 1970s. And these are the, this is a list of the foreign uh, countries that use this aircraft. Some of them were under the military assistance program, others were purchased. And you can see here in 1985, it, it was in service to under the Gabonese Air Force. Anybody know where Gabon is? Africa. Where in Africa? West Africa. Where in West Africa? 
Central on the Atlantic coast. Okay. Sorry to put you on the spot. That was close. Okay. The A1, A10 Thunderbolt was built on specs from the uh, Sky Raider. You can see on the, on the wings, increase in weapons, a very strong uh, capability on the weapon in the front, that's a 30 millimeter. There are some A1 pilots that called this an A1 with a zero after it. <laughs> because it was built off the specs of an A1 Sky Raider. Korean War comes along on July, June 25th of 1950, North Korean forces invade South Korea. And for those that don't know where that Korea is, there's the global map right here in Asia. You have Japan to the south, southeast, Sea of Japan to, on the east coast, Yellow Sea on the west, China to the north, and a very small piece of Russia right up here in North Korea. U.S. responds with the U.K. for land-based and carrier-based support for combat operations. And this is the four phases of the war. I'm not going to go over these in detail. Very beginning, you have carrier ops on the east and west coast uh, with U.S. and U U.N. forces. And as the southern peninsula, the South Korean peninsula, gets uh, uh, recovered uh, in combat, the Marine Corps sets up bases in the, in the peninsula for combat support and emissions along the parallel and the main line of resistance here at the end. First Sky Raider action is from the Valley Forge in July 3rd of 1950, along with the British ship the HMS Triumph. And the weapons load and extended time on target is really beneficial. My dad was a Korean War veteran 1st Marine Division, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, 1st Marine Division, Charlie Company Mortars. He was there the last year of the war, which was the outpost war. He saw a lot of planes coming in for close air support. He said it was wonderful to have the propeller planes go in because they'd hang around for hours, hitting the enemy and hanging around. The jets would come in and sweep in a little, maybe once, maybe twice, and they were gone. So he loved, they loved the uh, propeller planes coming in. Uh, this is a picture on the left that is from the uh, Valley Forge, and on the right is a Sky Raider dropping ordnance on a target, on North Korean targets. In uh, May of 51, Sky Raiders make a torpedo attack on the Washington Dam that was currently held at that time by North Korean forces. That is an actual picture from that day of an 80-4 with our torpedo on the center line, as you can see. Uh, from uh, Attack Squadron VA-195, they would be known as the Dam Busters after this attack. This is the bomb damage photo after the attack, and from an article from the Defense uh, Media Network, uh, I want to quote, uh, the heavy damage wiped out electrical power over a vast area. More importantly, the destruction of the dam broke up a planned enemy offensive, and everywhere the every way the damage inflicted by Sky Raiders and aerial torpedoes exceeded expectations. That dam wouldn't be repaired until after the armistice in 1953. It is in, currently in South Korean territory in the northeast corner of the peninsula. The aircraft was painted in navy blue. It's called the, the blue plane by enemy troops, and you can, as you can see from the pictures. 250 of the Sky Raiders were lost in combat, 39 to accidents, uh, 211 in combat. And 51 Navy and 14 Marine Corps pilots were killed in action. Rest in peace, pilots. 12 of the pilots were POWs and repatriated after the armistice was signed in July of 1953. And the combat uh, aircraft that uh, did perform were the Dash 2, Dash 3, and the Dash 4 model. The 80 Dash 5 didn't come into service until August of 1953, which was a part of the post armistice. Armistice support to the Korean post Korean War. The, the Marine Corps at the up to 1959 were starting to replace propeller planes with jet aircraft into 1964. Uh, they provided combat support during the Korean War to destroy resupply bases, tanks, trucks, troops, outposts, roads, bridges, rail systems, and dams and conducted electronic countermeasure recon and airborne radar and night attack. 
The Vietnam is the next war coming along. I'm going to talk about the Vietnam War from 1964 to 1965. That 64 is when we really got heavily involved. Prior to that, we were more as, as an advisors uh, to those countries. In 1962, the Department of Defense changed the aircraft nation so that the Air Force and the Navy would refer to their aircraft in the same coding and the same designation. So the 80-5 and the night version became the A1E model and A1G model. The 80-6 became the H model, A1, and the dash 7, the J model. And in between the wars, the Navy changed their color scheme to a gull gray and white uh, version versus the blue plane that you saw in the back. And of course, you see the blue room on the 80-5, and this is an H model. Quickly, on the right, you see the location of Southeast Asia in the Vietnam War. I'm, we're going to talk about mainly the support from 1964, which was started from the Gulf of Tonkin incident. This is the Ho Chi Minh Trail right here. I'll refer to that occasionally. It's, uh, it was attacked many times by Sky Raiders and other aircraft. And then the end of the conflict was when the Saigon surrendered in uh, April of 1975. Operation Pierce Arrow, the USS Ticonderoga and the Constellation participated in Pierce Arrow. What is Pierce Arrow? It's a response to the, uh, the attacks in the Gulf of Tonkin in August of 1964. The destroyers Maddox and Turner Joy were attacked by torpedo boats. President Johnson wanted a, a congressional resolution giving him authorization to respond and to respond very quickly and very forcefully he conducted the attack and ordered the attack on August 5th. The resolution wasn't passed until or signed until August 10th. So Johnson came ahead, but really that resolution gave him pretty much a blank check to build up forces in the Vietnam War. Uh, by 1968, we had over half a million troops in countries. This is a target map. They went after the torpedo boat locations in the Gulf of Tonkin, also the oil storage facility in Vinh, just out of, outside of Phuc Loi. During that operation, we lost our first Sky Raider pilot, Lieutenant uh, Sather. Also during that attack, Lieutenant J.G. Alvarez, a Jet A-4 pilot, is shot down and captured. Now, he is the longest held aviator in, in uh, North Vietnam, but he's the second longest POW. The longest POW during the war was a then Captain Floyd Thompson, Green Beret Special Forces, he was captured in the south, but he was held in uh, the Hanoi area in 1973 when the release happened. This is Lute uh, Lieutenant Commander Alvarez, uh, twice promoted during captivity, upon his release at uh, Clark Air Base in the Philippines in March of uh, 1973. And he retired from the Navy in 1980 as a full commander. Uh, Floyd Thompson uh, retired as a full colonel from the Army, and he passed away in 2002. Sky Raiders shoot down jets. Yep, they shoot down jets. There are two engagements. The first one is in June of, 19, of 20 of 1965. Um, two uh, MiG-17s go after two A-1 Sky Raiders. Well, that's not a very good match. Okay, you have a propeller plane going after a jet and vice versa. But they were victorious. They were participating in a, a SAR mission to pick up an F-4 uh, crew that was down in North Vietnam. One was confirmed shot down and the second as probable, and that's a picture of four uh, MiG-17s on the ground in the North Vietnamese Air Base. The second engagement is October 9, 1966, against four MiG-17s, against four A-1 Sky Raiders. They were supporting a rescue combat air patrol. One is shot down, confirmed. Second is probable, heavily damaged on the third one, and the fourth is unknown. There are actually three shootdowns by MiGs of the A1 Sky Raiders after that. I don't remember the dates, but there are three Sky Raiders shot down by MiGs. The last combat tour for the Navy was in February 1968 aboard the USS Coral Sea. They were transitioning to jets, the A4 Skywalk, Skyhawk, excuse me, the A-6 Intruder, and the A-7 Corsair II. 
uh, the Marine Corps had already transitioned to, uh, they had Skyhawks and the Intruders and F-4 Phantoms for their jets. In 1960, and this was prior to 1964, of course, uh, the Navy was supporting training and uh, operation for the Vietnamese Air Force, the VNAF, mostly at, out of Benoit Air Base outside of Saigon. But then in 62, the, that program was transferred to the U.S. Air Force, where the Air Force acquired about 150 E models. The E models are ideal for training, side by sides, left seat, right seat for training pilots. Acquired those, and then they did some feasibility testing for counter and surgery operations, <clears throat> excuse me, close air support, search and rescue escort, and special forces support. More acquisitions took place, and they actually moved the training out of Benoit area to Hurlburt Field in Florida. They trained around 300 Vietnamese pilots and around uh, almost 1,000 uh, U.S. Air Force pilots on Sky Raiders. Uh, for service in Vietnam, the, the Navy and Air Force Sky Raiders were retrofitted with an extraction system, the Stanley Aviation Extraction System. Stanley Aviation was actually out of Denver. It, it was established in the 1950s. There was actually a test track up there that they used the frame of the AD-5, the E model, for their testing of this extraction system. Now it's an extraction system, it's not an ejection system, which is really different. But there are YouTube videos showing how the testing of that, uh, of that system. Uh, they're twin rockets, they pull the pilot out, they began installation on the E, H, and J models in 66, and it was actually used in combat, saved pilots. From pilot activation to shoot deployment was 1.7 seconds. Can you count off 1.7 seconds? That's pretty quick to get out of that aircraft when it's in trouble. From left to right, you see the uh, pilot initiating the system here, the twin rockets expelling to its length. It fires, actually it fires and it's twisting, it's turning. It releases the pilot from the seat. The pilot's seat, which is a cup, actually folds down from the release and then pulls the pilot out and then shoot deploys. The pilot has been saved out of the aircraft. This is an E-model. You can see the twin rockets in the back seats. And of course we have a warning label on the side of the aircraft and you can see that on our aircraft on the side. Uh, there isn't an extraction system in this, I was told. Isn't that correct, Bill? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> But anyways, the, the, the sticker is out there to show that this had an extraction system on this type of model, and especially this aircraft in combat. <clears throat> Four squadrons were deployed in Southeast Asia, initially into the 56th Special Operations Wing, and then uh, the 14th and the 602nd. I am not gonna talk about the redeployment of the four squadrons. I'm gonna talk about when they were, where they were initially deployed only. And I'll show you a map on where they were located so you can see the coverage in the combat area. In 64, the 1st Air Commando Squadron, call sign Hobo. And in 65, the 602nd Fighter Squadron, uh, call sign Firefly, were at Benoit Airfield outside of Saigon. And this is a map of the area. Let me kind of point this out a little bit so you can get familiar with it. This is the South China Sea. Yankee Station, which was the Naval Operations Area. Dixie Station was down here for the Navy. This is South Vietnam, northern part, the southern part of North Vietnam, southern part of Laos, all of Cambodia, and about 95% of Thailand. And on the legend on the side, these are the major air bases with these symbols. You can see them scattered around. And these little green things right here is actually a little scope is a ground control intercept location and they provide uh, assistance for tactical uh, visual flight rules in the, co in the combat airspace. They would give vectors to certain points to air refueling, uh, command and control platforms for combat action. And of course you can see this is where ben Benoit is here, about 14 miles northeast of Saigon. And they pretty much covered this whole area during this time frame in 64 and 65. March 10th, 1966, a major significant event for an E-model. Uh, major Fisher lands his E-model on an airstrip under a, at the Ashoff Special Forces base that's under heavy attack on March 9 and 10. He actually rescues Major Jump Myers, who was also flying an E-model. 
And there's the Asha Valley area. This area right here, the valley area is actually about 25 to 30 miles long, about a mile to, mile to two miles in width. And from November, uh, late October, November time frame into April, it's kind of socked in with low cloud cover. It's hard to get in and out of, uh, if you're going after targets in the valley area. And, and some of the high points around the valley area are around 5,000 feet. Major Fisher, this is the Special Forces Camp drawing. This is from the actual after action report, actually. This is the Special Forces Camp here. This is their airstrip, which was made with PSP, perforated or perforated steel planking, PSP. We do have an example over in Hangar 2 of PSP. There are various versions of that. But the runway and the parking areas were PSP. It was battle damage from all the action that was been going on in the Mar on March 9 and 10. Major Myers comes in on this route right here. He is heavily damaged. He takes some high caliber rounds. He is actually on fire coming down into the airstrip. He drops his weapons. He's going to belly in. Well, it was centerline fuel tank didn't come off. Guess what happened when he skidded down that PSP runway? He kind of burst into a ball of flame, landed right about here. Miraculously, he jumps out and hides in the weed system in the ditch areas right in here. Major Fisher is watching all this happen, and he spots him hiding. Calls for a helicopter extract. Guess what? 45 minutes out. Well, Major Myers is going to be dead by the time that helicopter gets there. Major Fisher makes the bold decision to land his aircraft on that damaged runway and finds Myers. He makes it to the end, skidding to the end. He's got hot brakes. It's a very short runway. Turns around, finds him, stops the aircraft, pulls him into the right seat head first, and takes off. That is a very short version of what actually happened. You have to look it up on uh, some other uh, sites if you can find those. He is awarded the Medal of Honor for that action. That is Fisher right there on the left. And the center is a picture that was taken several days after because Myers was full of mud and he was singed. So he was a mess. And of course, that's Major Fisher with his award, the, the Medal of Honor. Uh, retired Colonel Fisher uh, re uh, passes away in August of 2014. And retired Lieutenant Colonel Myers uh, passes away in February of 2000, or excuse me, in 1992. Now, his aircraft is preserved. It's restored, brought back to the States, and is flown into the Wright-Patterson uh, Air Force Base, the National Museum of the United States Air Force, where it sits today. And it is the only uh, Medal of Honor aircraft that's on display at the museum. Continuing on with the timeline, timeline let me back up here. August 7, uh, Air Force units become special operations squadrons. Search and rescue missions by A1s are primarily losing the call sign of Sandy, Sandy Alert. And in March of 68, the 6th SOS uh, call sign SPAD arrives at Pleiku Air, Air Base in the Central Highlands of South Vietnam. And the 22nd SOS is at Nang Kham Phanam Airfield in, in Thailand. That's NKP. I'll be referring to NKP quite a bit. Call sign Zorro. And from the map, you can see the coverage that you have up in this area for Laos and down aircraft for SAR missions in uh, North Vietnam. Pleiku deploying in this area. And of course, you already have Benoit covering that area. So you've got pretty good combat coverage for four squadrons in the uh, combat airspace. By 1969, the war is well underway. There's a secret war going on in Laos and Cambodia. U.S. military is not really there. <laughs> chuckle, chuckle. We really were. Highly skilled special ops teams relied on close air support from Sky Raiders, and that's, and I'm including, and very heroically, the uh, military, uh, the uh, Military Assistance Command Vietnam Studies and Observation Group. Those teams out of uh, all, all over the place. They were supported by Sky Raiders, mainly out of NKP. Uh, they would forward deploy their base, their planes to Udorn and Uban in Thailand, as well as what we referred to as Lima sites in uh, Laos and of course to other South Vietnamese air bases as well depending on what the mission is and what uh, SAR uh, alert that they were on. Uh, weapons loads. 
the Air Force and the Navy had a variety of weapons loads. I'm going to have three, just three examples here. The first one is from the Navy, who I think has the greatest sense of humor in the world. They had a toilet bomb on their aircraft. <laughs> A nice mix of 750 and 500 pound bombs. There's actually a YouTube video of this pilot, Commander Stoddard, dropping that toilet bomb on a target. His wingman is taking the photograph, and he's very close. The bombs come off and kind of land where they're supposed to land. The toilet bomb comes off, and it, as you can see, it's not very aerodynamic. <laughs> it flops and turns all over the place and almost hits the wingman. And who knows what the Navy put in this thing either, so <laughs> as an explosive. <laughs> okay, the next example is an Air Force example out of Play Coup, and um, this is an H model. Centerline fuel tank, you have CBU, I think those are 25s on the Mark 51 bomb racks here. CU 25s ha is actually two shells together, and it contains about 200 baseball sized bomblets. So when that weapon drops off the plane, the barometric pressure fuse goes off at a certain setting. That shell, the primary cord around that shell blows off. Those baseball-sized bombets go everywhere. It's nasty. On the outboard wings, excuse me, I hit the wrong button here. On the outboard wings, you have Mark 82 500-pound bombs with fuse extenders, what we call daisy cutters. When that weapon drops and hits the target, the daisy cutter buries itself in, has enough delay on it so that the bomb is at the surface of the, of the ground and it blows out. If it didn't have that daisy cutter on there, it would blow up. So it's, it's quite an effective uh, uh, ground attack uh, weapon. The next example is out of NKP, an A1E model taking off. Centerline fuel tank, you see on the Mark 51 racks here and here are mini guns. 7.62, and I'll talk about those, more about those in detail. On the outboard wings, you have rocket pods. This is a 19, uh, contains 19 rockets, rockets here, and this is a dispenser that actually dispenses bomblets out the rear end tube. And there's two on each side, uh, or four, uh, four actually, two on each side for the rocket pods as well. There's another rocket pod here that's 19 rockets. So that's an example of the, uh, some of the variety that can be used on this aircraft. Sandy alert. Over time, the weapons load became very standard, and this is what you see as a standard load for search and rescue operations. Kind of nasty looking, isn't it? Well, it's highly effective. Let's take a closer look. On the outboard, you have on the first two on the outboard, you have the CBU 25s. CBU is cluster bomb unit. Those contain high explosive bomblets. And this is an example of the bomblet that comes out the end of this tube right here. These wings right here actually fold around the bomblet inside the tube, and when it's ejected out, those wings pop open on a short delay. It's armed. It hits the ground. Those wings, or those, uh, wings get hit, or sometimes it blows the weapon. The next one in that's a similar shape is a, is a CBU-22, which is... Uh, white phosphorus or Willie Pete smoke can canisters. And they look about the same, but they have a different color code on the weapon. Next in is the 100 pound white uh, phosphorus bombs, Willie Pete bombs. On the other side, I'm looking at the 19 uh, rocket pod, uh, the Lao 3, which is right up here. Lao is a launcher aircraft unit. The Dash 3s were 19 rockets each. You had two and eight, one on each side, that's 38 rockets. And that's the 2.75 inch folding fin aircraft rocket. That's what FFAR stands for. And those are the high explosive rounds right here. The next one in is a white phosphorus warhead. And that's the color code that you would see on these bomblets on that weapon right there. And of course you have the four 20 millimeter cannons on the aircraft. And then you have the mini gun. The SU-11 gun pod, which is suspended utility unit. It contains a GAO-2 uh, minigun. GAO is Gun Act Aircraft Unit, and that's the Air Force version of the fixed M134 minigun that the Army uses in a flexible capacity. This is fixed. It has 1,500 rounds. 
in the drum that's right about here, 7.62, and that fire rate is up to 6,000 rounds a minute. Do the math, math on hitting the trigger. That's quite a bit of rounds coming out of the, the weapon. And then of course you have the extra fuel tanks for extended flight. These are Sandys in support of uh, helicopters. The one on the top right is uh, an HH3 model, which was an earlier version of the Jolly Green. Then later on in the uh, war, the Super Jolly Greens, the HH-53s came into play, more powerful weapons uh, for search, search and rescue. This aircraft right here is an H model. I want you to remember, I want you to remember a couple tail numbers. This one right here, 606. I want you to remember that number. According to the National Museum of the United States Air Force, 4,120 crew were rescued during the Vietnam War under 2,730 combat situations. 266 were lost, uh, 201 for the Air Force, uh, 65 for the Navy, about 242 VNAF losses. And the Sky Raider pilots earned two medals of honor 14 Air Force Crosses and other awards like the Silver Star, Distinguished Service Cross, the DFC, and the Air Medal with V device for Valor. I could not find Navy statistics for the Air Force Cross equivalent, which is the Navy Cross. There were no Navy Medal of Honor winners for the Sky Raider airframe. There were for other aircraft. And of course, they did award Silver Stars, DFCs, and Air Medals for their pilots as well, well deserved. 144 pilots were killed, 13 in action, 13 in training accidents, 95 for the VNAF and one killed in training. Commander Stoddard, who I pointed out earlier, is on the list. He was killed the following year after that toilet bomb attack in North Vietnam. Rest in peace, gentlemen. Escape to Thailand. Here's where we have an interesting story. 1973, we had turned over all these aircraft to the Vietnamese Air Force. At that time, they were almost the fourth largest air force in the world, and a lot of our stuff. Peace accords were signed in uh, January of 1973. Things started taking place in February and March. Prisoners were released. US, was, U.S. withdraws from the area only to have just a handful of people as advisors and uh, consultants for this embassy. But North Vietnam doesn't honor that agreement very well. By late 74 and into 75, they're invading the South. They're gonna take it over. And they move very aggressively. By April 30th of 1975, South Vietnam surrenders. North Vietnam probably has about 1,000 of the aircraft, but there was a concerted effort to pull out our aircraft, get them away into Thailand. Now, there were about 36 to 40, and I couldn't find an exact number anywhere in the, all the literature I looked at, of Sky Raiders that were captured by North Vietnam. But about 165 in a coordinated effort out of Benoit were, were sent to Utapau, Thailand. There were actually more than that from other locations that made it into Thailand, probably another 150 to almost 200. Some of them actually escaped out to naval vessels out in Yankee Station as well. Uh, some of them tried to make it to the Philippines, some of them down to Singapore. Uh, it was a pretty frantic escape coming out of Thailand, but at 165 were flown out of uh, Benoit to Utapau. General, Brigadier General Adderholt, who was some people who that is, uh, pretty much, I, in my opinion, the father of Air Force Special Operations. He developed some of the programs in the 1950s during the Korean War. He's actually a World War II uh, B-17 pilot and a C-47 pilot. Uh, but he developed a lot of special operations uh, SOPs, or standard operating procedures. He was in the theater at the time as the commander of Military Assistance Command Thailand, or MAC Thai. His prior experience, he was actually the commander of the 56th Special Operations Wing. He established it at NKP Thailand. So he knew a lot of the A-1 pilots and he knew he wanted to preserve the A-1s, but he wanted to get as many aircraft out of South Vietnam as possible. We had some new fighter jets that the Vietnamese had received. Uh, you can't let the enemy have those. They were brand new off the assembly line. We had to get them out of there. 
This is a partial list. 31 F5s, which were the jets, the 1.6 Mach jets. The A37s, we do have an A37 over in Hangar 3. You might want to take a look at that when you, after this briefing. 130s, uh, Huey helicopters. C-47s, 11 A1E, and H model Sky Raiders. Now, in doing the research for this briefing, I was trying to find out how many E models made it out. This one for sure. And I found just, I only found one other one. And the tail number on that plane was 919, the last three letters, uh, numbers. That's the only two I could find. I think there had to be at least one more, but I can't find any information about another Sky Raider. So I think there were only two at this point that made it out. C-7s, which is a cargo light car cargo aircraft. Uh, 119 gunship, was, uh, uh, which was a kind of an antique gunship. Uh, U-17s, an observation aircraft, and a handful of civilian planes. This photo was taken on the 29th of uh, April in 1975. We have an E or excuse me, an H model on the right and an E model on the left. I strained my eyes, and I think they went double crossed, looking for tail numbers and see if I could identify this tail number and this tail number. This one, I believe, this is my speculation, is 332. I want you to remember that number as well. I believe this E model right here is ours. Now the reason I say that is that a nine does not look like that at the end. To me, that looks like a three. I think that's 683, and that's my opinion. I may be wrong, but I think that's the case because when these were flown out, they were, those two were flown out on May 5th to go to Takali when they, they were ordered by Adderholt, and they had to be right next to each other. So that's my opinion. I may be wrong, but I think this is 683, our aircraft, and this is 332. What the aircraft were done, what, what happened to the aircraft when they arrived in, in Utapau from Vietnam is that this, the Thais did not want any identification on those aircraft that showed them coming from Vietnam. They paint, some guy in a paint shop or a paint store in, outside of Utapau made a lot of money because they painted the insignia, the roundels, and anything identified the aircraft that's a South Vietnamese aircraft, they painted them over to hide them. Some of those planes that did escape were put on the USS Midway on the 5th and 6th of May uh, to get them out of there. Some, about a, a little over 100 were flown out to other locations uh, to escape out of Thailand. But Adderholt's intention was to hide these Sky Raiders. There were 11 of them. He had a couple of pilots that were working for him. It was uh, Captain Youngblood and Major Drummond at the time. They were his advisors in the theater. They were former A-1 combat pilots from a previous tours. So he knew that they had the A-1 skill, but they hadn't flown it in about three years. They had no checklists. The planes were a mess. They took off. Oh, come on. There we go. Before I get to that point, I want you to look, take a picture of this slide, if you would. These are two sources that talk about the escape and what happened in, in April of 1975. A very detailed version down here from the Air Force, from the monograph series, Last Fight from Saigon, published in 1985. That is the URL for it. This article from Air and Space Magazine is about six pages long. Very good article on how, what happened during the escape. Four Sky Raiders were flown out of Takali, excuse me, up to Takali for storage out of Utapau. Adderholt wanted all 11 up at Takali. There was a, a hangar up there that was for U-2 aircraft. It was a big maintenance hangar that was there. He had a very close, re close relationship with the commander of that base, the Thai colonel. Very close relationship. He was stopped after four airplanes. The State Department, U.S. State Department, told them to stop, and so did the government of Thailand. So those seven aircraft, the Sky Raiders, stayed with the Thai Air Force. But four of them escaped up the Takali, two on May 5th and two on May 6th. They were hidden in storage until 1979, and this is Captain Youngblood on the left and Major Drummond on the right. And I think they're in front of 332 when they landed at Takali. But the first day on the 5th, 683 and 332 took off for, uh, for Takali. This is a picture taken from our aircraft 
of 332. You can see the tail right here, the tail number. Also notice this, the paint over of the identification of the aircraft. That was on all of those aircraft that were on that airfield at the time and all of our Sky Raiders. But this was taken on the 5th of May. My light just went off. Is that good? I'm still good? You can still see me then. Okay, good. Okay, but this was taken, like I said, from our aircraft by Captain Youngblood of Major Drummond Flying 332. General Adderall took care of these planes and so did the Thai military. They were in storage from 1975 to 1979. And in 79, Adderall figured, I gotta get these things out of here. We gotta get them restored. We gotta send them somewhere. We gotta get them out of here. He actually paid for tractors to tow them out of the Takali of the airfield to a barge near a river system that would took, take it down to the port of Bangkok to get them out of, town, out of Thailand. Through unique negotiations, and like I said, I don't know the very details of this, but he was very, very well connected. He bought these aircraft, got them to Bangkok, hired a Russian trawler to take them to Long Beach, California for storage, where he connected with David Talashe from the, uh, pres uh, the president of Military Aircraft Restoration Company uh, Corporation and he takes possession of the Sky Raiders. And of course, those recovery aircraft, there's only three of them that are airworthy today. But in 79, this is what they looked like as Adderholt was taking them to get them down to Bangkok. They looked like they came off an assembly line. What the Thais did, they repainted them, they overhauled the engines, they fixed up the cockpit areas, the instrumentation, new tires, as you can see, there are no folded wings on the aircraft. They are on a, a storage area in the back, getting ready to transfer out to the barges on the river. But this is what they look like and what uh, Adderhall bought, bought. This one is 683, our aircraft here at the museum. The 3H models, 332, you remember 332? That is at the Smithsonian, it's waiting restoration. It's not, fly, it's not airworthy. Uh, Cavanaugh Flight Museum has 606. I want you, you remember 606 from that other picture I told you about? And then uh, 665 at the Tennessee Museum of Aviation in Seaverville, Texas, or Tennessee. And uh, that was how, actually rest helped restore by Westpac Restorations over here when it was in California. They worked on that aircraft. Okay, they're reunited. 1979 is the last time they were really together. And then in, at the Pikes Peak uh, Regional Air Show in 2019, there they are. 665, 683, and 606. And um, Captain, uh, what did, does anybody know what rank Youngblood retired at from the Air Force? Do you know? Was he a major? Okay. He was here during that. In fact, he signed off on a picture for me, and I don't think he remembers me at all, but, but I remember seeing him here at the air show. Now I'm going to talk about our history of our, the history of our aircraft here. It was built by uh, Douglas Aircraft in El Segundo, California. It was delivered to the Navy in uh, May of 1954. That is a list of the air, Naval Air Stations that was actually assigned to. And I did find a photograph of, say, that one of those stations. And of course, you probably can't see it real well, but that is 683 at a Naval Station. It was gained by the Air Force in July of 1964 and assigned to the 1st Air Commando Wing at Hurlburt Field in Florida for training. It was a training aircraft, and of course that is a picture in Florida, and you see the tail number on the picture. It was then assigned to a different unit, the same airfield, and then in 1968 in August, it was assigned to the Sacramento Air Logistics Area at McClellan Air Force Base in California for depot maintenance upgrades, camouflage paint, and preparation for transport to Southeast Asia under the military assistance program. And of course, in 1968, we still had over half a million troops in the area, so this was going to help the war effort. It was assigned in 1970 to the 56th Special Operations Squadron Wing at Nonconfinam Airfield, NKP, 22nd SOS, Special Operations Squadron. 
Before I go any further, I'm going to talk about me. <laughs> in May of 1971, I enlisted in the United States Air Force, thinking I would have a career that I could have something I could use on the outside. Well, the Air Force gave me an assignment and orders to uh, Lowry Air Force Base after basic training as a weapons mechanic for tactical fighter aircraft. What is a weapons mechanic? Well, it's a bomb loader, it's a, it's a weapons specialist on aircraft, on tactical aircraft. I went to Lowry from July to uh, October of 1971, and I put down on my dream sheet, I want to go to Vietnam or Thailand, I might as well get it over with. Guess where I went? Clark Air Base in the Philippines is what I got orders for. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot over, I told my instructor, I said, what is this? I want to go to Vietnam or Thailand and get this over with. He said, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Clark Air is used as a manning pool for load crews in Vietnam and Thailand. You won't spend hardly any time at Clark, and I didn't. I arrived at Clark Air Base in December 1 of 1971. I processed in, I had orders for NKP Thailand. From December 71 to February 72, I was at NKP. From March of May to May of 72, I was at Da Nang Air Base on F-4 loading crews, Rocket City. If anybody's ever been there, that's uh, the nickname of uh, Da Nang Air Base. From May of 72 to November of 72, I was at Udorn Airfield on the F-4 Phantom uh, load crews, finishing out linebacker one. Now, while I was at NKP, in the 462 shop, 462 is the career field number for uh, weapons mechanics. There's the weapons release shop, the gun shop, there's the gunner right there, and the weapons loading shop. I was assigned to the weapons release shop, which meant that I worked on those, on those bomb racks on the wings, did troubleshooting, remove and replace. I cleaned the pistons on those things. I just about touched every aircraft on the A-1 Sky Raider on that base, probably. And I'm sure I probably touched this aircraft as well. Uh, there was one situation, uh, it was an emergency situation, and Sky Raider was at the end of the runway, and they had a, the weapons control panel uh, for the pilot, didn't see his outboard uh, wings, uh, wing ordinance. Call this weapons release guys out to troubleshoot what's going on. I went out there with my supervisor since I was still kind of an apprentice at that time. Had my Mickey Mouse ears on, approached the aircraft running, which kind of scared me to begin with, to, to see that thing roaring. And we checked the outboard wing station and the pigtail that you see at the very end, you can't, I can't see it from here, but at the very end there's a pigtail that attached to a receptacle in the wing, it was actually sort of loose. The weapons crew didn't fully uh, latch the uh, collar on the receptacle. So we took it off, inspected the, the pins, looked at the receptacle, pushed it in, and clicked it over so it, it was held firm. The pilot did this, he had a weapon on his outboard wing. He's ready to go. So that was my hero event for the Vietnam War, I guess. Um, anyways, thank you very much. I appreciate the applause. <laughs> but, uh, but anyways, that's what I did on these aircraft uh, at NKP, and then of course I came home in December of 72 uh, and went on to Minot Air Force Base loading B-52 bombers uh, in SAC. Uh, and it, I think we have North Dakota weather here today for Granola. Okay, let me get back to NKP. This is an aerial map of NKP. It was built in 1962 by a Navy Construction Battalion 3. Um, you can see it's just a big old rectangle out of the jungle, 6,000 foot runway, a ramp with PSP and some cement. Uh, this is the arm D arm ramps at the end over here. These revetments in this photo are not there, but they were there when I was there. It was Alpha Bravo and Charlie Rose, and they were right at this end of the, of the ramp. This road right here is this road right here. Fuel dump is back here, bomb dump is here, and I lived right about there. If you take this road nine miles in that direction, you're going to run into NKP, which is on the uh, Laotian border at the Mekong River. This aircraft flew in combat for search and rescue, com uh, counterinsurgency operations, support to the MACV soldiers out in, out in, out in the, the jungles, and then in April, of 72, it was transferred to the South Vietnamese Air Force. On the tail, 
the emblem of the 524th, the 524th Fighter Squadron initially had A-1 Sky Raiders out of uh, Natrang. They transitioned to A-37s. We do have, an, like I said, we have an A-37 in the uh, hangar number three. It has the 524th emblem up at the top. Um, and then, of course, it escaped uh, from Benoit. This is the history of our aircraft. And, of course, I told you uh, the, the story about Adderhold pulling the planes out. So this plane escaped from Vietnam. Two pilots in the back. I can't remember the number. It was 16 or 18 Vietnamese family members were in the back as they flew out. I've heard stories of up to 25 people being in the back of these things as they were escaping. It was transferred to the Military Aircraft Restoration Corporation when it was eventually restored, and it was made in a airworthy condition in April of 1983. November 391147 is the identification number. It's under the tail. It was with yesterday's Air Force initially, uh, on display at March Field in California, and then went on to this gentleman here in Reno, Nevada for a few years, and then transferred to this guy in Circuit City, Utah, uh, in the Legacy of Flight Museum on display, and then pissed away LLC, and that is her real name, bought it last, <laughs> Greatest Generation Naval Museum, and then here in Colorado Springs at the National Museum of World War II Aviation. Now, I have a special feature. Sky Raiders in the movies. Korean War film, Men of the Fighting Lady, based on a, a real event. Uh, there are cameo pictures of the Sky Raider above and below deck. Uh, let's see, um, Van Johnson, Keenan Wynn, Joseph Cotton, and uh, Walter Pidgeon. Some of you might know who those people are. Okay, they're actors that have long gone, but they were in the film. The next film is The to Bridges at Tokori, which is a fictional war film uh, from James A. Michener's novel of the same title. You see four Sky Raiders are supporting what happened here. Four Sky Raiders are supporting uh, two down, three down airmen, actually. Uh, the F... 9F Panther jet right here, and there's a Navy rescue helicopter is down. And of course, these are the four Sky Raiders. William Holden, that plays the jet pilot. Uh, Vicki Rooney and Earl Holloman, Holloman are the uh, air crew for the Navy helicopter. They don't make it home, by the way. The Green Berets, 1968. There's probably about 15 seconds of four passes <laughs> by Sky Raiders protecting a, a, an overrun uh, Special Forces camp. By the time the sign comes up, John Wayne, Jim Hutton, and David Jansen rescue that base. You're supposed to laugh at that, John Wayne. Okay. okay. Flight of the Intruder, excellent film. A lot of good flying scenes in this film. Two, these two, excuse me, I'm hitting the wrong buttons here. These two Sky Raiders, 606, you remember 606? And this one right here, an 80 uh, 4, is painted up to look like an Air Force uh, Sky Raider doing a rescue operation for two downed uh, A6 intruders in the film, uh, starring Danny Glover, uh, Brad Johnson, and Willem Dafoe. Uh, the flying scenes, like I said in this movie, are excellent. Rescue Dawn, based on a true event of Lieutenant Dangler played by Christian Bale, that's Christian Bale right there. Uh, his book is called Escape from Laos. His very first and last Sky Raider mission, he is shot down over North Vietnam, makes it across the border into Laos, crashes, he's captured by uh, Pathet Lao communists, held of course, he escapes and is rescued. And his book, Escape from Laos, outlines what he went through. And the movie's not too bad, I've seen the movie. We Were Soldiers, I think everybody's seen this one, about the Idrang Valley uh, battle in November of 1965. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore uh, declares a broken arrow. He's got uh, enemy in his perimeter uh, that was played by Mel Gibson. And there's probably about five or six passes of Sky Raiders providing danger close air support for troops. 1968 Tunnel Rats. I don't think anybody's heard of this one. I, had a hard, I, can't remember, I can't believe I found this one, but it was a very short cameo of uh, Sky Raider dropping the air support uh, for a, down, for a, a troubled uh, army unit uh, near the Chuchi um, 
tunnel complex near the uh, Mekong Delta, south of Saigon. Devotion. If you haven't seen this movie, go see it. One Sky Raider uh, from the Ericsson collection uh, flies for the movie, uh, and only the other images you see are computer-generated images uh, for the movie, but that's another excellent movie, Korean War era. And you gotta have a video game with a Sky Raider, right? I found one. Okay. These are my references. The book on the left, this one right here, I highly recommend it for a Sky Raider pilot. If you know one, get it as a gift. It's an excellent resource. It was published in 2021. And those are most of the uh, uh, websites I went after. I probably went after a lot more than that. But these are the most common ones that had the most information.